Please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. If you have marker in your Bible, you might want to mark Luke chapter 16. We'll be coming back to this place. But we'll begin this morning at Luke 16 verse 18. Actually, it's Luke 14, verse 18, I'm sorry. Luke 14, verse 18. The Bible says, They all with one consent began to make excuse. That's where I want us to begin this morning. They began to make excuse. You know, I suppose it's good at this time to show a difference between making an excuse and having an excuse, perhaps. We all know a difference. There are times when we are excused, right? Perhaps uh, in our school days, we remember teachers giving excused absences, or maybe at work uh, there are reasons that are excused absences may have to do with one's health or uh, something uh, unex- uh, something extraordinary taking place that just couldn't be helped may be the case that uh, on the way to school or on the way to work the interstate was shut down because of a forest fire or something that you just couldn't take care of right so there are times when we understand that uh, things happen that are beyond our control that uh, we can't help. This isn't obviously what we're going to be talking about this morning. Even so, I might add this. Because we understand that there are times when we are going to run into situations that are beyond our control, I try my best to make sure that I don't run out of excuses. Right? You don't want to use your excuses without need, do you? When you have an excuse, you want to be believed. Some people make excuses, and they have excuses for everything, and they have excuses all the time, almost daily. And uh, they lose credibility, don't they? It may be the case that they actually are excused for something, but it's hard to believe them because every time you hear them or talk to them, they have an excuse. Like the story of the boy who cried wolf, right? Every time he cried wolf, there was no wolf until the one time there was a wolf. He lost his credibility, and so it's possible for us uh, if we find ourselves making excuse like these individuals in Luke 14 and what we're going to talk about this morning, to lose our respectability, to lose our credibility where people won't even believe us anymore when we do have a good excuse, when we have a legitimate reason of excuse. Obviously, this morning, we're not talking about legitimate excuses. We're talking about individuals who make excuse. I want to mark here in Luke 14 because we'll be coming back, but I want us to look in the book of Genesis chapter 3 and we'll find that here in the very beginning of time, man began to make excuse, didn't they? Here we find the excuse, I didn't do it, they did it, right? <laughs> So here we have the they did it excuse. Wasn't me. Not my fault. I, that wasn't me. Everybody can do that, can't they? Blame someone else. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 12 and verse 13, the Bible says, The man said, The woman who thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. I didn't do it. She did it. I suppose you could go even further and say, God, you're the one that gave me this woman. You did it. But it's a way to uh, blame someone else, isn't it? To excuse oneself, to make excuse and say, it's not my fault, it wasn't me, it's you. 
Then in verse 13, the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? Well, the woman had done something wrong too, obviously. And the man gave a little bit of truth there, right? The woman did give him the fruit to eat. But who's, she didn't force it down his mouth, did she? So, the, so God asked the woman, What did you do? And the woman said, The serpent did it. The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Well, the serpent did beguile her. It deceived her. But whose fault was it? She had the responsibility of deciding, right? She didn't have to listen to the snake. If a snake ever talks to you, don't listen to it. Right? That's a good moral of the story. If a snake ever talks to you, don't listen to it. The devil here showed his face as a serpent to Eve, and she said it was the devil's fault. Right? The devil made me do it. Right? That became a very popular statement by a heathen individual. But uh, the, they did it. Wasn't me, right? I've sit in meetings and had heard individuals, almost one right after another. Wasn't me. Wasn't me. Wasn't me. Wasn't me. Wasn't us. Well, it sure was. <laughs> and they must have felt guilty or they wouldn't have been making excuse, would they? Wasn't me. They did it. The reason the man made excuse was he felt guilty. The reason the woman made excuse is she felt guilty. They were hiding from God in the first place, weren't they? And God found them. In Exodus chapter 4, Exodus chapter 4, verse 1, Moses said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. God told Moses to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, Let my people go. But then he had to go to the people and say, Follow me out of the Egyptian bondage into the promised land, right? So Moses said, Okay. The Lord told me to do something, I'm going to do it, didn't He? Well, no, not exactly. He said, the people won't believe me, Lord. They won't believe me. It's their fault that I can't do this job, isn't it? So Moses makes one of five excuses here in this text. And it is, they won't believe me. It's their fault. Somebody else did it. In Exodus 32... We read of Moses' brother, Aaron, who was actually God's response or answer to another of Moses' excuse. Moses said, well, I'm not eloquent of speech. We'll get into that in just a moment. And God said, well, I'll send your brother Aaron, and he can speak on your behalf. But in Exodus chapter 32, Aaron makes an excuse. Verse 22 through verse 24, you'll remember the making of the golden calf. A false god, little g. And uh, God sends Moses off the mountain and says, These people have created themselves a false god and they worship it. I was going to give you the law, but right now you need to get off this mountain and go down there and fix this. And Moses said, What have you done? And Moses, and Aaron, verse 22 says, Let not thine anger of my Lord wax hot, Thou knowest the people, they are set on mischief. <laughs> what have you done, Aaron? You know this people. They are set on mischief. For they said unto me, verse 23, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we know not what has become of him. So Aaron says, It wasn't me, it was the people. You know, even if that were the case, Aaron acts as if he wasn't responsible, didn't he? Like he couldn't say, no, we're not going to build. We just left a land who built golden calves as gods, and, we, and look what God did to them. Do you not remember the ten plagues? 
But look at verse uh, 1 through 2 of chapter 32. Remember, Aaron said, this people told me, they came to me and they said, make us a God, right? So uh, chapter 32, the Bible says, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, up, make us gods which shall go before us, for as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we know not what has become of him. Okay. Well, there's a little bit of truth in this excuse, right? But look at verse 2. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them to me. It sure sounds like Aaron took responsibility for the calf at that point, doesn't it? He became, he became the leader of this God created. In Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 verse 1. Chapter 1 of Romans chapter 1 goes through some sins that were committed by Gentiles. And uh, from the text and from the context and from chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 2, we, we get the idea that the Jews were sitting there saying, that's right, those Gentiles are heathen. Those Gentiles do some ungodly things. They are ungodly. And, and thank goodness we're not them, right? And then in chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says, Therefore thou, speaking to the Jews, are inexcusable. You don't have excuse. Whosoever thou that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. <laughs> you sit here and condemn these people, say, they did it, look how bad they are. And you're doing the exact same thing, Paul says. You're condemning yourself when you condemn them. So when Aaron said, they did it, when uh, Adam said she did it, when Eve said the serpent did it, what were they doing? They were condemning themselves, weren't they? They don't have excuse, they're inexcusable. They're condemning themselves. Verse 3, Thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Well, of course not, right? Well, of course not. And there's no excuse. If you can understand it's wrong for someone else, then you obviously understand it was wrong for you. <laughs> Therefore, you don't have an excuse. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, Paul says, We dare not make ourselves of the number that... Uh, He's been having somewhat of a discussion with the people there in Corinth and, and uh, it seems that in this context they were uh, basically asking Paul, why aren't you more like them? And so uh, Paul says, we dare not make ourselves of that number. And I think he's being a little sarcastic, to be honest with you. Oh, we dare not be like them. I mean, they're way too bold. They're, you know, they, they're way too bold for me. Or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves. And comparing themselves among themselves. Are not wise. Now what's Paul saying? Why would I want to be numbered with the people. Who judge themselves based upon themselves. Right? Right? They, they just, well, he did it, so it's okay for me. She did it, it's okay for me. Right? They did it. Wasn't my fault, they did it. I just got caught up in it. Paul said, that's not wise, because what they determined to be right or wrong may not be right or wrong. In fact, it wasn't right. The only standard we need to judge ourselves by is God and God's Word. 
And if we judge ourselves by God's word, then we'll know when we're right, we'll know when we're wrong, and we won't have excuse, will we? But Paul said, don't be among the number, and I'm not going to be among the number, who judge themselves by themselves. He did it, therefore it's okay. Or she does it, everybody does it. You probably heard that everybody else does it. Everybody else says it's okay. The only thing that proves is everybody else is doing it. It may, it may be everybody else is wrong. And you know what? A lot of times that's the case. <laughs> when people say everybody else does it, well, do you want to be wrong like everybody else? So that they did it, right? That's the they did it. Wasn't me. Excuse. Then we go back to Exodus chapter 3 and another one of Moses' excuses and we see a, another kind of excuse. It's the excuse of personal limitation, I suppose. Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. Moses says to God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Well, some might look at this and say, Well, Moses was a humble man. And humility, obviously, is a great thing. But humility is not an excuse, is it? Who am I, Lord, that I should go to Pharaoh? You know, I wonder, does he not think God thought about that before he asked him to do it? Maybe God knows who you are, Moses. <laughs> God knows who you are. Who am I? So, some might say, well, that was very humble. I would, I would perhaps contest uh, false humility. Who am I that I should go? Well, God knew who he was. God told him to do it. In, uh, then in, uh, in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, another time, uh, Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. I am slow of speech and of slow tongue. Therefore, so, uh, I mean, who am I to go before Pharaoh? Pharaoh's king, I'm a nobody. And, uh, well, that excuse didn't work. Because God said, I know who you are. I've, I've chosen you. Well, I'll, I'm not eloquent of speech. Maybe God knew that too, do you know you think? So here I am, I'm making an excuse based on my person. I can't do that. That's what people say today, and I can't do it. That's too hard for me to do. We, I'm sure everybody in this room has probably said that at some point in time. I can't do that. That's too hard for me. That's out of my wheelhouse. That's not my, uh, you know, that's not my forte. So what? <laughs> so what? Does God uh, tell us to do things that we can't do? God has never told one person in the history of the world to do something that they couldn't do. When people say this is too hard, it's an excuse. Because <laughs> God didn't make it too hard. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 30, Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. That's verse 28. Then in verse 30, he says, My yoke, which is, he says is my teaching. My yoke is easy. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. So when he tells us to do something, it means it's doable at least, isn't it? If God says do something, it's not too hard for us to do. God says my yoke is easy. My burden is light. It's at least doable. Right? He takes away that excuse then, right? It's too hard, I can't do it. Basically the excuse, the real reason is I don't want to do it. <laughs> In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, Paul by inspiration says, there's no temptation taking you that you can't overcome. But that God will make a way by which you can escape it. That's a paraphrase. There's no temptation that you can't overcome. So, if the teaching of Christ is easy and His burden is light, and everything, that means if He tells us to do something, it's doable. We shouldn't have excuse. And that even with temptation, He makes a way of escape. We can't say, uh, Lord, the temptation was too great for me. Right? That's not to say that the temptation may not be great. It may be a great temptation. But it's not undoable, is it? It's not, 
It's not something that you can't overcome. Now either God is right and God is telling us the truth or He's lying, right? If we come to the conclusion that, well, the Lord said we can do it, but I can't do it, then the Lord's lying. If I can, if I can come to the conclusion that this temptation has overtaken me and I, it's not my fault, I can't overcome it, then the Lord lied, right? We don't want to be on that side of the fence, calling God a liar. When God tells us to do something, it's not too hard to do. You can do it. You have the ability to do it. It's just a matter of whether you're going to do it. Is it your desire to do it? We can't blame our personal limitations. We can't use that as an excuse. And then back in Luke chapter 14 where we begin, we see a series of excuses that deal with perhaps one of the most used reasons of excuse today, and that is inconvenience, really. Isn't it? It's inconvenient for me to do. <laughs> and you might put in that priorities, the idea of priorities. Luke chapter 14, uh, verse 16. The Lord uh, speaks here and says, A certain man made a great supper, and he bade many to come. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first one said, I bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray have me excused. And another said, I married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Now listen, these are all legitimate responsibilities, right? One man had a responsibility over a piece of ground. Another had a responsibility for his oxen. He needed to take care of them, test them, prove them, make sure they were able to do the job they could. One had a wife. He had to, uh, that's a responsibility to take, to take care of the wife, to, to be a, a husband, right, in the, uh, that's faithful to God. But those are not excuses, are they? Truly, what the individuals are saying, I've got more important things to do, Lord, than to come to your supper. I've got more important things to do. This is inconvenient. Maybe if the supper was held at a different time, maybe if the supper was on a different day, blaming God, saying you've made it inconvenient for me. People today... Use that excuse a lot, don't That's inconvenient. Now, if it's just a matter of priorities and one thing is equal to the other, you might say, I don't want to go to either of those, and that might be all right. <laughs> right? You might say, well, that's just not convenient for me. Well, that might be okay, depending on the, the situation. But if it's a matter of God, it's a matter of spirituality, are we going to put worldly things above spiritual things? And that's what these individuals did, wasn't it? Now the truth is, they could have gone to the supper and still taken care of all their physical needs. Once again, God's not going to tell us to do something we can't do. We just pointed that out, right? He's not going to allow us to be tempted above that which we are able, so we can overcome the temptation. And He's not going to bid us to come to a supper when we can't go. And He's not going to tell us to forsake our wife or our families He's not going to tell us to forsake our responsibilities as a landowner or a businessman. He's not going to tell us to forsake our responsibilities uh, uh, to, to the things that we uh, have entrusted to ourselves to take care of. He's not going to tell us to ignore those things, are, is He? And that's not what He told them to do. He said, come to the supper. The feast is ready. Come now. And so these individuals had time, it's just they didn't make time. It was inconvenient for them. That's inconvenient. And usually people, uh, as I mentioned just a moment ago, people will do what they want to do and people will go where they want to go. <laughs> That's the truth, right? That's the truth. 
If it's inconvenient, it's because they don't want to go to the supper in this particular example. If they wanted to go, they'd go. This is why it's not just inconvenience slash inconvenience, it's also prioritizing. People can prioritize things in their lives. And God has to be number one in our life in order for us to have our priorities correct. But when God says come, we ought to come. <laughs> He's not saying neglect your other obligations. He's just saying put me first. And if we put God first, we'll go. We'll go. In Acts chapter 24, verse 24 and verse 25, the Bible says, After certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was a Jewess, they sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as uh, Paul reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. This is not the right time, Felix said. Felix said, this is uh, not a convenient time. This is uh, an inconvenient time. And uh, you come back. Now, we're never told whether Felix said, hey, today's convenient, come back. We're never told that. It seems that Felix left things undone. We're not told that. But it sure seems like that's the direct. He didn't make time for God and the teaching of truth. And it doesn't seem like he made that ever. His excuse was, come back at a more convenient time. Come back when I want to do it. Right? People today use that as an excuse. The, con the inconvenient, that's inconvenient for me. I don't want to do it because it's inconvenient. Lastly, we see that there is the excuse of ignorance. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, Deuteronomy chapter 30, beginning of verse 9, the Bible says, The Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every good work of thine hand, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiced over thy fathers. But notice verse 10. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, for this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee. Neither is it afar off. There are individuals today who say, well, I just didn't know about that. I didn't know. You can't hold me responsible for something I didn't know. God said, this command is not far away. And it's not hidden. Which means they, they had an obligation and a responsibility to know it. It's not hidden from you. God didn't tell us to do something and then hide it from us so we couldn't know it, right? To, so we could, well, Lord, I didn't know about that. Well, whose fault is it? It'd be my fault, wouldn't it? Because the law is there. Today, we have the complete inspired Word of God. You can buy it in a, general, in a Dollar General store. You can buy it at a Dollar Tree. You can buy it anywhere. You can buy it for a dollar. You can buy them in, in genuine leather. You can buy them in different colors. And you can open it up and read it. There's no excuse for not knowing the law of God today. And there's nobody on the day of judgment who will get away with saying, I just didn't know. Because you should have. If you want to know, open up the book. Read it. Know it. That's why God gave it to us. 
And that leads us back to Romans chapter 1, verse 20. We mentioned the Gentiles and the sins that they had committed in Romans chapter 1. And chapter 2, Paul said, You, the Jewish nation, are inexcusable because you do the, th- the same things. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, some might say, Well, the Gentiles, they just didn't know any better. They had, they, it's ignorance. But notice verse 20. The Bible says, The invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. They are without excuse. Now what's He saying here? Why are they without excuse? They had seen the evidence that God is. And if they knew God is, they should have been finding out what He wanted to do. Deuteronomy 30. The the law is not hidden. If they wanted to know the truth, they could find it. They could seek it. And they could know it. There are people today who say there is no God. And the evidence of God screams all around them. You know, um, I can prove that God is based on the nature of rational, reasonable, logical thought. Okay? The earth exists. We all agree, right? The earth exists. Now, it either created itself, which is scientifically impossible. It came from nothing, which is scientifically impossible spontaneous combustion, or someone made it. And that's the only three choices you've got. Now, I can be irrational and say it created itself. That's irrational. Right? It's against logic. I can say it came from nothing. That's irrational. It's scientifically impossible. Or I can say someone created it. There's only one rational conclusion, and that's someone created it. If you look around and you see the creation, you have to say there must be a creator. And you might not know who it is, you might, but you know there is one. Now if you know there's a creator and he has the power to say exist, what's the next logical step? I might want to find out what he wants me to do. So we're without excuse. Ignorance is not an excuse, right? Ignorance is not an excuse. Most people who say there is no God today, they're not ignorant. They're lying to themselves. And they're believing other people's lies. That's not ignorance. So we've seen some categorizing of excuses today. Blaming someone else. Blaming personal limitations. Blaming convenience or the lack thereof. And blaming ignorance. And the Bible tells us none of these are excusable, are they? We don't want to be found on the day of judgment without excuse. We can open up the Lord's Word and we can find out about Him as much as He wants us to know about Him and as much as our human mind can know about Him. And we can know everything God wants us to know in order to go to heaven. He tells us that in His Word. That He's given us all things that pertain to life and to godliness. He tells us, for instance, how to be saved from our past sins. He tells us that it requires faith and that faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God, Romans 10 verse 17. And He tells us that our faith can't be a dead faith, a faith that doesn't do anything. Faith without works is dead, being alone, uh, James 2 verse 17. God wants us to have a faith that's alive, that works, that does things. Our faith must lead us to repent of our sins, for instance. Luke 13, verse 3, Except you repent, you'll always like, uh, all likewise perish. So our faith will lead us to repent of our past sins, and our faith will lead us to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, based upon the facts and the evidence presented in the Scripture. And our faith will lead us to be baptized in water to have our past sins washed away. On that first Pentecost after the death, burial, and resurrection of the Christ, the audience asked, being guilty of their sins, what shall we do? 
And Peter said in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So God wants us to have our sins remitted or taken away. And He gives us the way to do it. Repent and be baptized in order to have your sins washed away. Every example of an individual who had his sins washed away followed that same example. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Then God calls upon us to be faithful unto the end. Revelation 2 verse 10. Having been added to the Lord's church, Acts 2 verse 47, by obedience, God tells us to be faithful unto the end and He shall give us a crown of life. And so that's why we're here today and that's our goal. We're not looking for excuses. We're looking to please God. And so today we ask that you please God. Don't look for an excuse. Look to please God. Obey His commands. Be saved today. If you've already obeyed those initial acts and have become a Christian, but have fallen away or had something get in the way of your Christian life, take care of it today. If it's of a private nature, ask God to forgive you. Take care of that sin privately. If it's of a public nature, we're here to assist you if we can as we stand and sing.